Aesthetic Field, and this is an official event of the Friends of the Idlewild Library. And is the most junior member of the Friends. Uh, I've been elected to uh, come here and introduce this event. You know you have a great event, A, when the room is full, and B, when people are fighting over you to introduce uh, the speaker. But today's speaker has a special entree on the field. He was roommates with Jeff. Clark. Clark, thank you. <laughs> uh, Co-publisher and co-editor of the Idlewild Library. So Jack's going to come from Idlewild Town Crier. I'm making sure I don't have to do this again. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I'm curious about one thing. Is there anyone here attending for the first time? Wow. Okay, well, an extra special welcome to all of you. Um, and we hope to come back. And one more little thing, I, I'm kind of, again, as a, a convert, being the new kid on the block as part of this library, the Idaho Library is getting ready to observe its 100 years of continuous service to the community. So before there was a saloon and before the fire department was open, we had a library, and I think that really says something about this community. So, Jack. I have uh, described this book as uh, being a page turner, and it really is one. Uh, Tom had, had already told me, of course, about some of the incidents that took place in the book, uh, but reading about them seemed completely fresh. He has a way of uh, drawing you in that makes the pages kind of disappear, and you just join him, whether it be one an adventure in a uh, ill-equipped hospital operating room or out on the frozen tundra. Uh, and his dialogue makes you feel like his Alaskan friends are somebody you know personally. So uh, Tom's wife, lovely wife Patty is here, but I'm going to let him introduce her to you because I know he wants to do that. So let's now hear from physician, adventurer, author, lecturer, actor, and uh, my roommate and uh, good friend at UCLA from more than a half a century ago, <laughs> Dr. Thomas Jack Sims. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, it's hard to think. 50 years ago, 51, 52 years ago, sitting around, uh, probably having a little beer every now and then, having coffee, sitting around uh, a dorm room at UCLA, that 50 years later we would be doing something like this. So uh, life was very exciting. I'm sure that you will all agree with that. I certainly agree with that. Can't thank you enough for coming today. Um, I just mentioned to somebody, this is the largest crowd. I do a lot of uh, speaking um, about my book uh, and about the principles behind my book. This is the largest crowd that I've had so far. Uh, I knew it would be because you guys uh, here over in Idlewild first uh, love the arts, number one, which uh, we all do. Uh, and you read, <laughs> which I really like. <laughs> and so I really appreciate your coming. Um, my wife and I uh, spend, uh, we're the kind of people now, we no longer live in Alaska. A lot of people think we still live in Alaska. We do not. Um, we left, and if, in, in the book, if you have a chance to read the book, or choose to read the book, um, you'll find out why we no longer stay in Alaska. Um, but I made my career practicing medicine in uh, Oregon. Uh, we now divide our year up between Bend, Oregon, if you know where that is. We live on about 30 miles out of Bend, way, way up in the mountains on the shores of the Big Deschutes River. Um, so I can fish from my backyard, I love to say that. Uh, and then we spend our winter months uh, down here in a motorhome uh, in Indio, California. So uh, that's why we're here. Um, I have, been, before I just get into the book a little bit, just a, just a little background about the book, because people are interested. Is there anyone that cannot hear me, by the way? Everyone can connect, good. You're okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I've had some people say, uh, and they read the book, and they said, we don't believe the book is true. Uh, they said, uh, first of all, nobody can have a life like that. And how could you possibly remember all of this stuff that happened 40 some years ago? Uh, and I have two answers for that. Number one, every single thing in the book is 100% true, with the exception I have changed some names. Uh, most authors that write memoirs do that. Um, and I did that to preserve privacy of some people. Uh, some people deserve to have their names smeared around, but uh, that wasn't my job, so I did change some names. 
The other comment that I make, uh, or that people suggest that the book can't be true, is that um, my wife, when we went to Alaska, we had a two and a half year old child, and she was pregnant with uh, our second baby. And um, my wife has a degree in zoology, and she absolutely insisted that our kids have an aquarium. Because we had no TV, no movies, no nothing, up and no. She wanted them to watch the aquarium. And you can't have an aquarium without having tropical fish. And you cannot buy tropical fish in Nome, Alaska. Trust me. And I had the job of figuring out how we could get the tropical fish we had in California, where I was an intern, up to Alaska. Uh, no Alaska, not just Alaska, no Alaska, which is the end of the world. And I love to tell, so I'm going to tell you what I say. I did it, you got to read the book to find out how I did it. <laughs> but the person said, I can't believe it, I guarantee you it is true. Everything in the book is true. All right, as we begin this little adventure, rather than just talk, uh, yes, please, if you would lower the please, thank you. Um, Maybe, what, can you go up one click so I can see a little bit? Just, uh, is that okay? Can everybody see that okay? That's yeah. okay. Um, I'd like to have you for a moment get into the mindset that I had and that my wife had. Before we go, I do want to introduce my wife. Pat, could you come up here just a minute? Um, this is my wife um, of 53 years. Two. 52 years. <laughs> uh, we had, a, we had a little thing at UCLA. Um, Becky, you were not part of it. You weren't in the picture at that time. But it was Jack, a fellow named Steve, a girl named Carol, uh, Pat, and we were kind of like the group around the dormitory. Um, she was the cutest one ever, I thought. <laughs> and um, we became laboratory partners. We were both pre-med at the time. We became laboratory partners at UCLA. And um, I love to say, we met in comparative anatomy. <laughs> because, we, because of math, and because we did meet in comparative anatomy. The real one, and then the other one also. <laughs> but this is Pat, and when we're, when we're finished today, um, I'd like to have a little Q&A if people have some questions. And here's the reason I'd like to have that. As we, we have some women in the audience, when we go to, we do a lot of book signings and a lot of things like this. People love to talk to Pat and ask her questions, especially women, more than they do me, even though I wrote the book. Because her life, this adventure, was every bit as much her life, of course, as it was mine. So at the end of this, we'll have a little Q&A, and uh, maybe she can answer some questions. What it's like to be a pioneer mom, a real pioneer mom, having a baby with no diapers, having your husband deliver the baby, those kind of things. Um, she'll, she'll enlighten you. <laughs> okay. So what I would like to have you do for a minute is just to kind of put yourself in uh, my mindset for just a moment as we first went to Alaska. Well, I want you to suppose that no matter what your station in life is, what you do now, let's say that somewhere along the line, uh, you train for years to be something, uh, a homemaker, a librarian, a mechanic, it doesn't matter. Let's just say, just imagine for a moment that you trained for something, and you had your tools, and you knew how to do it, and everything was great. And let's suppose in this example, you trained to become an aircraft mechanic. So you had a good buddy, like Jack and I are good buddies. You went out and you found yourself a little fixer-upper airplane. And you decided, because I know how to build airplanes, I know how to fix things, we're going to go ahead and we're going to turn this into a usable aircraft. So that's what you did. The fruits of your labor were really good. And you took to the air. And everything was just great. You were having a great time. Until all of a sudden, the unthinkable happened. And maybe you're in Alaska, maybe you're in Montana, Wyoming, it doesn't matter. But you're someplace out in the Thule's, and you have a crash. And in the crash, nobody was killed. It was just you and your friend. But it messed up the airplane. And one thing that really did happen is that, oops, your friend got a broken leg. Okay. Well, you used to be an EMT before you went to mechanic school. And you knew that with a broken leg, he's in a lot of pain. He was going to lose a lot of blood. He was probably going to shock. And pretty soon he was going to die. So he thought, well, I have to save my friend, and I'm an airplane mechanic. I can fix this. And then you say, wait, I have no tools. I have no books. I have no way to take care of the problem. Imagine how you would feel in your heart, in your gut, if that happened. Well, you can imagine that. That's exactly the way I felt when we got off the plane in Nome, Alaska. 
and we went into what is lovingly called the Maynard McDougall Memorial Hospital. <laughs> we, uh, many of us that worked there added an M, another M, a fourth M. We called it the Maynard McDougall Memorial Mausoleum. <laughs> because using the word hospital with this place was uh, the biggest understatement you can possibly imagine. And I'll get into that in just a moment. But I was that aircraft mechanic. I got off this plane. I was all alone. There were no other doctors. I knew I was going to set with doing surgery, delivering babies, doing surgery without uh, anesthesia, under flashlights many of the time, delivering babies under Coleman lanterns, flying out to Eskimo villages to do God knows what, delivering our child because I was the only doctor. And those were the things I was faced with. I was 26 years old. I had, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that. The year was 1971. Richard Nixon was president. Pittsburgh Pirates uh, have won the <coughs> series. And war was raging in Southeast Asia. I, was, I had just finished medical school now, nine months before. Medical school, you're a baby, you're coddled. Then I went into my internship where you have three months of medicine, surgery, obstetrics, and pediatrics. And I was nine months into that surgery, uh, in, into that pediatric program. I hadn't even completed it. And suddenly I get notice I'm about to be drafted. And I'm going to be drafted to go into Vietnam. I was at San Joaquin General Hospital when that happened. And they knew because I was interested in surgery, I would be drafted out of my pediatric residency program. I had been accepted into that program to act as a MASH surgeon in Vietnam. Well, of course, that was a life-changing thing for us. We never discovered uh, why I was drafted other than the fact that I was still in training. It was an automatic deferment until you finished. Jack and I, we registered at the same draft thing. Jack was never drafted, and the only thing that we figured was that I would be drafted because of that. Well, as good fortune happens, and as explained in the book, I had an opportunity, instead of going to Vietnam, to join the U.S. Public Health Service. And the U.S. Public Health Service at that time was a division of the Coast Guard. And it will fulfill my military obligation, and I could go. I was in pediatric resident program. I was going to be a pediatric surgeon. I was first going to be a neurosurgeon because I love that kind of work. But Pat and I would have to have lived in a large town to do tumors like I would want to have done. And we're small town people, we're not large town people. So pediatric surgery was somewhat similar. Fine manipulative movements, do a lot of work under magnifying lenses. And I love that kind of work. And I was offered, uh, if I would go and uh, join the public health service and go to Anchorage, Alaska, uh, the large native hospital there, uh, was building a brand new pediatric wing. And I was going to be chief of pediatric surgery. Wow. Hell yes. <laughs> you know, not bad when you're 25 years old. You've got virtually nine months of training under your belt. And I'm going to be chief of pediatric surgery. Sounds really good. Where do I sign? So I signed. It was military. If you're military, uh, you know they orders lie. can change. They lie and they exaggerate. And we found out um, very soon, probably about a month before we left, that there had been a slight change <laughs> in our orders. And instead of being a pediatric surgeon head of the department, I was going to be a GMO, which is a general medical officer, and I was going to be in Nome, Alaska. <laughs> wow. We didn't know what Nome, Alaska was. You had to, we had no Wikipedia then. We had to go to the library and get a thing, get an encyclopedia, and look up Nome, and you could hardly find it until way, way over there. It was Nome, Alaska. And I remember, it was very funny, we had, we had no idea, and this is not part of the talk, but we had our two-year-old child, we're expecting a baby, and we thought, well, you know, no Alaska, we like small towns, it's going to be okay. So I wrote someone that was supposed to be in charge of housing, and I said, you know, would you please find us a house to live in? We'd kind of like a two-story, and we, we'd like to have a nice yard, because we have a dog, and a cat, and a couple of kids. We found out later, everybody lives in shacks made out of tar paper there. We found out later we were the laughing stop of Kotzebue and the other places, because we had no idea what we were going to be facing there. Well, my book is a memoir. Uh, and I just want to tell you just a second what a memoir is. There's some confusion on that. A memoir is not a biography. A biography is the story of a person's life, usually begins at birth, and ends either at their death or when a major life event ends, such as their presidency, like Clinton's thing. That's a, that's a biography. If it's an autobiography, it's written by the person, obviously, before they death, but lived that life. Well, a memoir 
is just a segment out of your life. It could be an hour out of your life. It could be a day, it could be a week, it could be two years. But it's a segment of your life that changed your life forever. Going to Alaska changed our life forever. And it has a theme with it. It has a principle that other people can apply to their life. And that's what a memoir is. And my book is definitely a memoir. It's not a biography. My book is an account of what happened during a period in my life and our life. And the, the accounts that I talk about in my book by way of scenes. The book reads like a novel. Uh, there's a lot of adventure, there's a lot of sadness, there's a lot of funny things in it. But it did teach us three vital lessons that we learned in our life that literally changed my life forever. Changed my life as a physician, changed it as a husband, changed it as a father. And at the end of this, I'm kind of clue you in just a little bit what those three principles are. The principles are pretty important because um, once a book was published, there's been, uh, my book is published by Pegasus Books in New York. And um, after it was published and some um, promo was done by publicists and some other work, I was giving a, a blogging assignment with Psychology Today. Uh, perhaps you're aware of Psychology Today. And uh, my blog will last at least a year, maybe longer. And it blogs under the title, Under Extreme Circumstances. And what I talk in this is how you use these three principles in life to adapt to your own life, no matter where you live. You don't have to live in the Arctic, you can live anywhere. So that's what the book is like. My book takes place in the Arctic of Alaska, and if you don't know where that is, just trust me, it's a long, long ways from here. And if you can see the little red mark, that's unknown. The little mark with the circle down there, that's Bend, Oregon, where we live. Uh, down here in California, it's significantly farther away than the East Coast is. So that's where our memoir takes place. Okay. Again, the book is a memoir. The book has also been called a hybrid. Um, my uh, literary agent pitched my book as a hybrid, and they pitched it as a blend between Northern Exposure, Doc Martin, with a little Alaska Bush people thrown in on the side. <laughs> and that's what the book is. But really, in actual fact, the book is a tale of adaptation and survival. That's really what it is. It's an account of what happened a long time ago at the top of the world, uh, that changed the course of our life forever. I had to perform surgery without real anesthesia and under flashlight illumination, commonly. I delivered babies in remote Eskimo villages under Coleman Lanners, commonly. Uh, and I even traveled over some death-defying terrain that we talk about in the book just to try to get the job done. When talking about, uh, and oh, I'm sorry, the book was written to inspire others to think about how I solve problems up there. And these were under real extreme circumstances. And then once you've read the book, I hope that people will stop to think about how they can use these three set principles that I'm going to tell you at the end here in your own life when you can solve problems in your own life when life throws you a curveball. And that's the theme of the book. And that's what distinguishes a memoir from a biography. It does have a theme. And you'll get the theme when you read the book. Here's a little video we did.
scenes uh, in the video uh, depict accounts that we had in Alaska. Uh, they're all true. Um, and of course, every one of those is defined uh, by this telling of the story in the course of the video. I am happy to say um, that the video has done a lot for us. Uh, I'm pretty excited that um, it's buzzing down in Los Angeles and in Hollywood right now. And uh, Hollywood is a hard nut to crack, and we know that, but we have some pretty important people behind us there. So we're hoping one of these days maybe we'll see this on film. Uh, we're looking at motion picture rather than uh, television series. We're not, we don't want to be a reboot of Northern Exposure. We want this to be if anything comes of that. I'm never discouraged by things like Hollywood is a hard nut to crack. New York is a hard nut to crack too. And uh, we, we cracked that with uh, getting our book published in uh, New York. So I figure if you don't throw out a net, you're never going to pull in a big fish. So we're going to try that. Okay, so let's keep moving here. Just right here. Okay. The book started when we gathered up all of our stuff. If you look down here, some of this will be the do uh, a dog, two cats, the aquarium, which is someplace down in here, uh, and all the way that we gathered up our stuff. Uh, our daughter had chicken pox at the time, but uh, we decided no matter what, we had to make it up there. Um, so we boarded the plane and we um, flying up. It was our first look at Alaska through the window there. And that was our first look at Anchorage. Well, we thought, well, Anchorage is pretty much like Nome, so it's not going to be so bad. <laughs> they actually have roads and everything, you know. So we were actually kind of encouraged. We saw the nice big Alaska Native Medical Center. Not bad, I'm sure I'm gonna be here a couple weeks, and then we're gonna have our nice new wing, and we're gonna be back here, and I'm gonna be, you know, Chief of Pediatric Surgery there. So that was the ANS Hospital there. It was a long, tiring trip. Uh, Pat had shorter hair back then. Uh, our daughter was exhausted. And uh, we stayed in um, Anchorage about three days when I had Arctic Survival Training. The training was to last two days. It lasted about 20 minutes. And uh, we were taught two things in Arctic Survival. Number one was if you're involved in a plane crash, I was going to be flying all the time. I didn't know this. If you're involved in a, in a plane crash during summer, you're taught how to cover yourself in mud so the mosquitoes don't kill you if the crash didn't. They always press every, preface everything. If the crash doesn't kill you, learn how to do this, do that. And then in winter, I was taught um, if the crash doesn't kill you, how to actually build an igloo or borrow down in the snow to try to keep alive. So my two-hour Arctic survival consisted of that. I started wondering then, you know, what exactly have we gotten ourselves into? But we didn't, we didn't really know. That's Nome, and that was our first look at Nome from an Alaska Airlines jet. I think I have another little view of it here that just kind of shows it a little bit different. And when we first looked at this from the air, it didn't look too bad. We thought, oh, we've got, you know, um, Oceanside Town, we've been having beachfront property. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this was Nome. Um, we landed at, uh, this was a great big um, uh, Quonset hut. Uh, that had turned into, we called it a landing field at that time. It was paved. The only runway except an anchorage I ever landed on that was paved. And you haven't lived until you've been a 727 and you've landed at Unilaclete on gravel. It's really scary, but it always happened on Wednesday. So if I ever had to go to Anchorage, I tried to avoid going on Wednesdays if I had to go by jet because I did not want to land on gravel. But this, this was the Nome Airport. We did have transportation. Uh, the Public Health Service arranged uh, this old uh, World War II Jeep for us. So this is what they gave us. We got in there. Um, there were two seats. They were the kind of chairs that y'all are sitting in now. They weren't, you know, real seats. And they were wired with coat hangers uh, to the bottom of the thing. Uh, and so I could drive, pack it next to me. The back was completely open, but it was great because we could pile all our stuff in it. And uh, that was our first uh, shot of Nome. There was one paved street in Nome. Uh, it was Front Street, and uh, that's kind of what Nome downtown looked at. And finally, after begging and threatening and everything else, we did with the hospital, not, not public health service. When you read my book, you will come to hate the hospital administrator, as did we. Um, he made life absolutely miserable for us, but he was able to arrange this hut. This little hut for us was actually called, we called it the BIA house. It was owned by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There's a BIA, knows BIA. It was for the teachers, and we arrived in July. The teachers were gone until the middle of August. So we were allowed to stay there, and according to this um, hospital administrator, the moment that the BU teachers were out, we, there, we were out. And when the question was, out to where? The answer is, your problem, not mine. And it was not a problem of the PHS. We were really, really on our own. It was very difficult. And remember, uh, Pat was pregnant at the time. Well, we couldn't have done it had Pat's mom not gone with us. This is Grandma, 
and uh, we referred to her as Grandma, Grandma Flanagan. When we got to this BIA house, we did have oceanfront property. It was right across a road uh, from a beach, if you will, of the Bering Sea. And it was uplifting to be there. Uh, and Grandma was not about to let this go to waste. And I did want to read you uh, something from the book. I have a little picture here. I'm not going to read very much from the book. I want you to read it on your own. I, I just would like to, uh, to have you hear uh, how, how we described this property. With the Bering Sea right outside our living room window, there was no containing Grandma's excitement. Grandma wasn't about to let anything stand in her way of our ocean view. So soon after settling down with the honey bucket, which is what we used for a toilet, she went to work. She gathered up a wad of discarded newspapers, leftover paper towels she found in a cupboard, and using just water and spit, went outside and scrubbed away months of salt and dirt that had collected on the window since the teachers had left the previous May. The fruit of her labor was spectacular. Gone were the high-rise condos that dotted the shoreline of the Santa Monica coast. Gone were the highways, the traffic I loathed, the beachcombers scrambling for a place to park. There were no ships, no oil rigs, not a single pleasure boat as far as the eye could see. The only obstacle that disrupted the beauty of the quiet horizon was the glimmering summer sun as it's made across its arc across the ocean, the ocean in front of us. There was complete silence, broken only by the blow of an occasional wail or the lapping of tiny waves upon the sandy shoreline. It was sky, earth, and sea in its natural state, the way it had been since the beginning of time. And that's how we felt about it. And it kind of uplifted our spirits a little bit to, to knowing and this is what we would see out our window. And um, it was really worth it. Well, once again, this is the Manor McDougall Memorial Hospital where I worked. And one of the very first things I had uh, was a young man. And I would like to read you just a little bit about this. I start the book with this. This is on page three. The first part of the book is an introduction, tells how we got to know him and why. But this is chapter one, first paragraph. The first time I saw a kid die, he was staring straight into my eyes. I didn't know the boy well, but that didn't matter. My remorse was so intense, my sadness so profound, I knew I could trade places with him at any moment and regret not a second the consequences of my decision. It wasn't that I was unfamiliar with death, for as a physician I dealt with it since the moment I made that first slice into my cadaver or inhaled that first whiff of formaldehyde. But I was his physician, his doctor, and watching him lie there, slipping away moment by moment, powerless to do anything for him, tore up my heart until my spirit felt as dead as his. Even now, recalling that cold Arctic night, to think back on it, to talk about it, is like opening a crypt, seeing again images burned into my mind that time has failed to erase. I got a lot of criticism uh, for starting my book that way. Um, a matter of fact, my literary agent um, said you have to start the book slow. Why were you in Alaska? Build, build the ark, do all of the stuff. My agent said that and, a, and an editor said that. Uh, and I thought I'm dealing with people from New York, I'm dealing with people that know how to sell books. But I have a certain degree of arrogance, I guess, about myself. And I decided no, I was going to, uh, was going to start it the way that I wanted. And I, I had a wonderful interview uh, not long ago on NPR, uh, National Public Radio, which my publicist got a fabulous opportunity for me. And the interviewer asked me about that and said, what a stark way to begin a book. Why did you start it that way? And my answer was, I wanted this book to begin with a punch. I wanted people to know that this was going to be a true life adventure of what it was like there. There was no sweet talking it. There was no making it good. I started this way. There's light moments, the birth of my son, the birth of the, and here is wonderful. But I started this way on purpose. I entered my book with that beginning into a contest given by University of California, and I won that contest. And I'm positive I won that contest because I started the book that way. 
My book has very short chapters on purpose. I think people like to read short chapters. Get something and get it done. So that's the nature of this book. That's how it's written. And I just want to tell you just the last little bit. I'm not going to read the whole chapter about this boy. But what happened was we discovered the boy had inhaled glue. It had an overdose of glue. He was dropped off by some friends at the hospital. And we tried to resuscitate him. And all of a sudden, he awakened. My God, I said to Connie, uh, Connie, who hadn't seen the boy move, he's coming around. Hold up a minute. She was doing CPR. Connie stopped blowing into the boy's mouth as I stopped chest compressions. I slipped my hands behind his back to help him sit up, confident his breathing would be easier in that position. The boy followed my lead and struggled to take an upright position. At first, he looked confused, disoriented, and then he cocked his head as if he recognized me. His eyes stared directly into mine. His lips parted as though he wanted to tell me something, but hadn't the strength to speak. He held the stoy, the stare for the briefest of moments, and then his arm dropped back, his head slumped to one side, and he slipped away. I silently held the boy in my arms as sadness fluttered over me. I burrowed a knuckle deep into his breastbone and rubbed a maneuver to elicit a, a reaction in an unconscious patient, but there was no response. I glanced over to Connie, my nurse, my expression telling her that the boy was dead. She began to weep. I wanted to reach out and take her hands, console her, tell her she had done a fine job. But I knew the words would be empty, better just to remain silent. We looked down at the young man lying still in front of us, mesmerized by the sight, for even when he died, the boy's eyes remained open in a pleading stare. I had to reach down and pinch them closed. And uh, he was 13. Um, his father had just taken a job about six months before uh, with Alaska Airlines. He wanted to uh, get in with the other kids in town, drugs way back then, and that's what led to this. And, and I opened the book with this scene because this is what I had to deal with. No defibrillators, nothing to do but by the seat of our past medicine. That's what happened to this boy. Did a lot of traveling when we lived in the Arctic. Uh, mostly I flew my planes. These are some examples of what we did. If we went across water, I was responsible for St. Lawrence Island, um, which was about 100 uh, water miles from the coast, and also for Little Diomede Island. I'll show you that in just a moment. Anytime we crossed over water, um, government regulations meant that we had to go in a twin engine plane. Um, I called this my second car. I went all over um, Norton Sound uh, in this plane. It literally, it was my second car. Um, my chauffeur for this car, his name was Otis Hammond and Stinky Hardy. Uh, Otis Hammond is named Otis Hammond in the book. Stinky Hardy because uh, he had passed away and I couldn't get permission to use his um, name from his family that still live in North Pole, Alaska. I call him Sparky in the book. But uh, Stinky Hardy was my pilot on this. This was my third car, snow machine. We used this vehicle um, to go back and forth from the trailer where we lived into my clinic. Every place we went, um, towing a dog sled behind us was used with our snow machine. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, this slide is my favorite slide of all of my slides that I have, except those from my family. I took this from uh, flying south from Kotzebue back to Nome. And this was taken from an Alaska Airlines. And when you look through this slide, that my laser printer doesn't work. Uh, these are two islands. This is Little Diomede, and this is Big Diomede. And way in the distance there, that's the coastline of Siberia. It reminds you of Sarah, Sarah Palin. <laughs> but that's Russia. Big Diomede is Siberian. It's Russia. Little Diomede is the United States. But the cool part is the international date line runs right between those islands. So looking at that slide, you are seeing into tomorrow. So you can see the future just by looking at that slide. So I think that's my favorite slide. I had to do a lot of surgery. I had no choice. I couldn't put people on a plane and fly them to Anchorage. Most of the time, we couldn't fly anywhere. So I did a lot of surgery. I like to call this my labor induction. Um, Pat would not go into labor. She was absolutely positive her body was not going to go. Maybe it was the altitude or the longitude or whatever hell it is up there. Latitude, I guess. So uh, we borrowed a little motorcycle. She is like three days away from delivery on that. I remember my dad saying, I was born on December 29th. 
And my dad wanted the tax deduction thing to get at the end of the year. So I remember him saying he drove my mom over Bumpy Roads to get it. Still remember that. I thought, all right, we'll go for a motorcycle ride. So we went for a motorcycle ride over the tundra like this, took our daughter with us. It worked! Um, because a few days later, the wonderful event happened. Um, we have a seal skin back here that I invite you to touch and feel. Probably haven't had a chance before to feel a spotted seal. Um, I don't like to kill animals. I love animals. Um, back in those days, we did not have Eddie Bauer. and We didn't have L.L. Bean and all of that. Our boots were made out of seal skin. And so we hunted uh, spotted seals. We ate the liver. The liver is fabulous. It's better than calf liver. The Eskimo people would eat the flippers. I declined eating um, seal flippers because when I was at Eskimo villages frequently, I had to eat walrus flippers. Uh, and I guess seal flippers are more bitter than walrus flippers. They're horrible, to tell you the truth. Um, but we did use every part, and then the Eskimo people would use some of the other meat, you know, from the animals. Um, so we went out. We do have a scene in the book um, where I um, attempted to get a spotted seal. I like the one we have here. We also have another show and tell thing we'd like to show you there. Um, it's, well, I'll show you when we're finished here. It's a Siberian wolf ruff. Let me just take it right now for just a second. We would be dealing with temperatures that easily on a windy day could be 100 degrees below zero. Very, very cold. Uh, we did a lot. I had to travel back and forth on the snow machine, so it's very cold. Um, so we, we had a heavy, heavy coat and we had a ruff. And everybody likes to use this. And I ask you to, to, I won't pass it around, but I'll show you here. Pat had to sew a backing on it like this. And this ruff, this is a Siberian wolf. This is chosen because the guard hairs are very long and they are filled with air. And that and then enables them to hold. And this goes on the back of your parkie like this, on your hood. And it's not a parka in Alaska. It's a parky, and we make that very clear. Good, so whatever those, like it's a snow machine. I can't even say snowmobile without hesitating. It's a snow machine when you're in Alaska. And when you go out into these freezing temperatures, you bring your hood up, of course, and then you flop this forward, you tie it, and it makes a breathing tube like this. So it's about this far from your face, and it gives you about 10 to 12 inches to warm that air before it goes down into your lungs. That would enter your lungs that cold. I had a mustache at the time. You would still get icicles on your mustache. But this is the kind of rough, but I would like to have a feel of it. It feels fabulous. So um, Siberian Wolf was, gave its life for us. Thank you. And uh, that was my friend. He was a local pharmacist. This time we were in an aluminum boat. Uh, many times um, we went out in umiaks, uh, which were Eskimo boats, and an umiak is a, a large boat uh, on a wooden frame, usually driftwood, that just uh, goes up on the shore and is covered with dried reindeer skins. And those are the kind of boats that we use primarily. Um, we were three miles, we were about 25 miles up the coastline from Nome and three miles out on the ice. Uh, and the ice is about eight feet deep there. We would gig for tomcod. We would take the tomcod, cut them into chunks, uh, tie them on a rope. I use a weight, a snow machine, um, uh, a spark plug as weight, drop it down in the water, and then about every 10 minutes we would lift it up and we would experience something like this. And this was our, our usual take at the end of the day uh, that we would get this kind of an Alaska king crab. If you've never lived in the Arctic and eaten one you just caught, I'm not just saying this. You've never eaten Alaska king crab. There's nothing like it. Uh, we would usually cook one for the two of us and our, our daughter. Our son was too young to eat it um, because there is so much meat. It's like, you know, the chicken legs are that big. The meat is so delectable, uh, we would not even put butter. Not that we could get butter very often, but if we did, the meat is so delectable. Because as you will read in the book, we lived until our shipment arrived, which was just before the ocean froze. We lived on crab and salmon. That's all of it. We had, a, we had a lot of experiences with walrus. Um, I made a trip, it's not in the book, but I made a trip out to St. Lawrence Island one time, and the good ship Calypso was out there, and uh, Jacques Cousteau was not on the, the boat, but uh, Philippe was, and had a wonderful conversation with Philippe. They were doing a um, documentary on walrus that we saw later, and we got to see the film crew, and they had a baby walrus down in the pit of the uh, ship that had lost its mother, and so we got to see that, but we had a lot of interaction, ate a lot of walrus, uh, when we were there, we ate a lot of reindeer. This is a reindeer um, or a caribou. They're exactly the same, by the way. Don't let people tell you they're, they're the same. It's not an elk. Uh, we did have a chance to uh, deal with a polar bear. I like to make it sound really neat that we were outside and a polar bear came into our property. It isn't that way. Walt Disney was filming a movie <laughs> up in the Nome area. They brought a polar bear in. 
I don't think the polar bear was sick. I was the town vet, by the way, because there was no vet. And, uh, we, did a, we did a lot of veterinary medicine, and Pat was the first assistant. She did as much surgery as I did. Um, but we did have an opportunity to, uh, to have some exchange with that polar bear. Um, this is our dog, Tiak. Um, Tiak is an Eskimo bird. It's an Eskimo bird or an Arctic bird. Uh, that's what Tiak means. She is a real Alaska Siberian Husky. She was born on the shoreline of the Bering Sea. And uh, she was a wonderful bitch and we brought her home. We actually bred her a few times and had some puppies for her. And um, I just, I throw this slide in um, uh, just because I'd like to just read something else from the book or tell you just a cute little story from the book. Um, I was on OPB, like I said, in January. OPB is an affiliate of NPR. And out of all the scenes and everything on the book, and we, it was about an hour interview that we had, um, there was one um, that the commentator wanted me to read. And it was about the birth of our, of our son. And um, so I'm going to change here for just a minute. Um, at last count, I had like 67 uh, reviews on Amazon. Uh, all but two were five star. And one was a, um, a four star. Uh, because a person objected to some of the um, adult language in the book. And I was kind of sorry about that. Um, I, I didn't, but I wanted to uh, write a comment on it um, because I wanted to say, hey, we lived in the Arctic. I really toned the book down here for this. So I had to because he told me because of FCC rules, um, I had to skip a couple of words. So I will skip a couple of words here too. But um, it's a little more graphic in here, but not too much. Um, my last rotation in my internship was uh, OBGYN, and I delivered uh, quite a few babies in my three months that I was there. Everybody in OBGYN knew that we were going to Alaska, and we had a five-day hiatus between when my internship ended and my commission began in the public health service. And during that five days, we had no insurance at all, and of course, due date was at that time. <laughs> so they had arranged for us to do a home delivery. And we were going to do it. We were all set to do it. If the baby was born on the plane, we could do that. So we had an entire delivery kit <clears throat> that they made for me that they kind of pilfered a little stuff from the hospital. <laughs> Everything, including little footprint things and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but one thing that they did when we opened up this delivery kit, um, there was a little brown medicine bottle like this. And inside, when you open it, there was one little pill. And on the outside of it, it said Valium five milligrams, <laughs> just in case. So I want to show you a little bit uh, about how that all came to pass. This is what he wanted me to read on the video. I was so busy, and Pat was so busy, and we had a two-year-old. It just, we never focused on the idea, we're going to have a baby one of these days. There's no phone to pick up and call and say, hey, she's in labor. It was going to be me. And suddenly when she said, it's here. I'm in labor, and I checked her, and it was. I got this feeling over me I can hardly describe. And then I remembered Valium. <laughs> <laughs> I rushed into the bathroom, opened the bottle, and here's what happened. I'd never taken a tranquilizer in my entire life. What will it do to me? My thoughts raced to my mother, how her speech slurred, and her gait wavered when she was under the influence of her pills. What if the pill did the same to me? What if the Valium sedates me to the point I can't manage Pat's delivery or actually pass out, at least without any help at all? God damn it, anyway, why did I take the pill? <laughs> there was only one thing I could do. I stuck my finger down my throat like a bulimic teenage girl and with a few horrible wretches brought the tiny pill up into my mouth covered with bits of slime and stomach acid. The Valium hadn't dissolved yet, so the drug hadn't started to course through my veins. Tom, hurry, I think the baby is about to come. I don't know what instinct drove me, except, except for love of my wife and concern for her well-being. But Pat needed me to be calm and in control, too. So I bit the regurgitale in half. I swallowed one portion, and I handed the second portion to her. Her greatness, I said. What is it? She said, please, just do it. With complete trust, Pat put the milk the pill between her lips and swallowed. Now I said, kissing her firmly on the lips, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> So that's a little different than our first. <laughs>
<laughs> um, I made a lot of trips to Gullivan. I, I just put one in this because I want to tell you just a little bit about it. Gullivan is the Eskimo village, probably about 125 air miles from Nome. Everything is air miles from Nome because you can't drive any place from Nome because uh, there's no place to drive in Nome. And every place that I went, I had to fly. Uh, Gullivan, like in the picture, is built out on a, on a sand spit. Um, all of the little shacks, all the little houses are built from metal uh, that has washed up on the shore or driftwood and things, and um, that's the kind of thing. Um, every house has a person in it called a village health aide. And every morning, uh, seven days a week, my job, starting at seven in the morning, is to go on these old, old, old-fashioned radios like you see on TV, call out to these 13 Eskimo villages, and people like this wonderful lady, who was trained for about a week in Anchorage, would describe symptoms to me. People would line up in front of her, and she would call me, and it would sound like, this is where we're going, I don't want to hear from you. That's what it would sound like. And I got used to it after a couple of weeks or so. I could sort of get it. And I would call, it was KMM712 Gamble. I would call them, and I was KAC something gnome. I forgot our call numbers now. And we had to follow the regulations. And I would have to make these diagnoses. Uh, pretty hard to do when it's a rash, by the way, <laughs> trying to define a rash. But we had, to, we had to diagnose abdominal pain, trauma, all kinds of things. The village healthies were wonderful people, and I felt strongly that when I went out to an Eskimo village, I wanted to stay with the village health aid. I was always invited. I was also invited to stay with the teachers. The teachers, 100% of the teachers at the time I was there, they were BIA teachers, were white. We had no black teachers. We had no Eskimo teachers. They all lived in the school. They all had electricity. They all had nice little apartments. But I really felt I would relate more to these villages because I really depended upon them. So I would always stay, and we would stay in a house like this. She has a power. She has an electric thing, you can see there. She was, because she was a village aide, aid, aid, she was there. She was on a generator, of course. But I would stay. These are dry seals around the place. I would stay with them. I would use this deep on ranger skins on the floor uh, and um, start seeing clinic every day. Well, when I went to Gullivan on this one particular trip, I had to deliver a baby. Uh, a young Eskimo girl was having trouble. So we boarded a plane like this. You can see the sleds. This is how they would pick us up with the snow machine attached, take me down to the village. And this girl, we would cross over the frozen sea. And then, when we got down to the village of Gullivan, the pilot that took me, Otis, said, Doc, I can't wait for you. I have to go home. There's a big storm coming in. But call me on the radio, and I'll come back and pick you up. When I left, I left with my go bag, which is just a medical go bag, a stethoscope, some Tylenol, you know, a few things like that. Really nothing, maybe first aid stuff. No clothes, uh, my coat that I wore, nothing else. Ten days later, I was still weather bound in Gullivan. The elders finally came to me, and they know how much I wanted to get home for various reasons. Pat had no idea where I, where I was. Um, but they said if I could make my way across the frozen Bering Sea to the village of White Mountain. And you've heard of White Mountain. There was a song, something, something on old White Mountain a long time ago. White Mountain was the only village I took care of that was not on the coastline of the Bering Sea. It was inland on the, on the um, Fish River. And the elders felt being inland a little bit, the weather would be better. Maybe I could catch a small plane home. So I tell the elders, I'll do anything to get home. How do I do that? And they said, we have it solved. He'll be here tomorrow morning. The next morning, there was a pound on the door. I opened it, and here's Petey. And Petey is an Eskimo boy. He's about 16 years old. And he says, Doc, I'm going to take you to White Mountain. I said, how are you going to do that? He showed me his, his, uh, his ski do. He had that snow machine. On the back was a dog sled, like you see in pictures here, piled with boxes this high. He was taking um, supplies over to White Mountain. And he caps the top of the box and he says, I tie you on here and we broke this lunch. And so that's what we did. And anxious to go home, uh, I did it. I want to read you just a short little bit about what happened here. So I am on the box, tied to the box. I have a line from myself to his girlfriend. It's a whiteout, of course. I mean, I couldn't see the sleep. I couldn't see anything. But I'm to tug on this line if I fall off. <laughs> and so, uh, jerked a couple times, no problems. And then, bad jerk, I pull the line. And of course, I get the end of the line. Oh my God. We hit a rise, like one of those annoying speed bumps in a parking lot. Slamming down, the sled shook so hard, my sleeping bag pitched to one side, and the boxes shifted. 
with nothing to grab, my Bitsy lifeline, that was a girlfriend, Bitsy, was gone, and the boxes no longer were bound together. I was the mercy at gravity. The snow machine lurched forward, and as it came down over the rise, the sled followed. The unexpected thrust threw my body backwards, and with no forewarning and nothing to grasp, I careened head first over the back of the sled and crashed down onto the ice below. I landed face down with only inches away from open water. <coughs> Barely able to breathe, I squirmed to rid myself of the bag like a butterfly fleeing itself from a, from a cocoon and crawled out onto the ice. Stunned by the fall, I waited a moment for my head to clear, then stood and looked around. I was engulfed in darkness and flurries of snow. There was no sign of the snow machine, no sign of help, nothing to ease my plight. I was lost, prisoner to the elements against which I had no defense. I knew right then I was going to die on this uncharted journey, lost in a storm and frozen to death. Pat would never know what became of me. Luckily, I was dry. My head hurt and I felt a crick in my neck where I twisted upon hitting the ice. Both arms and legs worked well, and without discomfort, no apparently extremity was fractured. No extremity was fractured. Far in the distance, I heard the drone of the snowmobile as it sped away. I frantically waved my hands and cried out, but I knew it was restless. Exhausted from the struggle, I knelt down on the ice and cradled my head in my hands. Already my hands had begun to ache from the cold, and my face tingled from freezing wind. All I could do now was wait for the inevitable to happen. I, I began to sob and hope the end would come quickly. I remembered reading that freezing is not a comfortable way to die. And uh, so that's what happened on the shores of the Bering Sea. Breakup. Uh, breakup is also a phenomenal. Uh, I'm gonna, I have a, a passage that I read about that, but I'm not going to read it here. I just kind of want you just to look a little bit at the scene. That this is kind of what breakup looks like. Large flows of ice form, and then they begin to crack apart. And when they crack apart, they balloon up into the, to the sky. And then when they crash down, they create these gigantic waves. And the waves flutter and flutter and flutter. And then the rivers start to break up the same way. And they end up with these large ice flows like this. And the whole thing of Arctic breakup um, takes about two to three hours, and it's completely over. And it's a good time that we can go out that, to hunt for seals. Piccolo Pete, um, I was in clinic one day, and an Alaska State Trooper pounded on my door, demanded to see me. A fellow that I knew around town named Piccolo Pete, because he wheezed when he talked, because he'd had his nose broken too many times, was sort of a um, harmless, paranoid schizophrenic who was a hypochondriac. <laughs> but he felt that the people in the village of White Mountain had fed him some tainted reindeer meat and the reindeer meat had caused him to get cancer. So he took a plane out to White Mountain. He was sitting on top of a mountain. His breakup had happened then. He was sitting up on top of the hill, and as people were going down the fish river with his rifle, he was shooting at them. And he was going to kill as many of the people as he could. And the Alaska Strait people told me uh, I had a choice. They had to go out White Mountain, and they had to stop Pete. He was harmless. I, 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 he was just a funny little guy. And uh, they said that we were going to have to just attack him from both sides and shoot him dead. Or I was going to have to be able to talk him off the mountain. <laughs> and uh, how do you expect me to talk him off the mountain? And their answer was, you the doctor, you figure it out. Right? <laughs> so I had a job of uh, flying out to White Mountain, uh, landing, um, walking my way up to the top of the mountain. The police could not take me. If you saw the police, he'd shoot us all have a meeting with Pete and try to convince him uh, that he should come with me back to Nome rather than shooting the people. I did this with him standing like this, holding a 36, a 30 odd six, right at my forehead, waiting to shoot me. I'd never had anybody point a gun at me before, uh, and I had to come up with an idea. Uh, and I did. And so if you read the book, you get to figure out. <laughs> I do want to read one, I think it's one more little passage from the book, because this is one of my favorite passages. Um, it's describing, and I'm almost finished, uh, it, it is describing the Northern Lights.
I was feeling poorly. I was depressed. I was having a tremendous amount of trouble with the Arctic darkness. And we needed something to raise our mood. And so my wife Pat decided we should go for a little drive one night in the car. We could still take the car out. So we did. And here's what happened. I came across a small plowed turnout where I could make a wide turn. Just as I pulled off the main road, a curtain of bright light overtook a curtain of bright light overtook the northern sky, rising from the horizon high into the cosmos as far as the eye could see. The light became a drape of changing color, a tapestry of gathered folds and pleats that danced and swirled like a celestial ballet. Colors in the curtain morphed from shades of green and yellow to oranges and blue, then hues of pinks, scarlets, and deep purples. It was like an artist's palette had fashioned a veil of rainbow colors that exploded into a cold Nordic air over a, bar a background array of star-studded night. <coughs> We'd seen the northern lights many times, but never in the shapes or hues we saw that evening. It was a magnificent sight, and though I'd never been one to consider sights or omens as anything but superstitious myth, that night I accepted the aura as a gift. Godly advice to put aside my fretful disposition and accept life in the Arctic with enthusiasm and delight. To be happy, all I need do was open myself up to the Arctic's wonders and possibilities and allow good nature to take its course. Sitting there in the Pontiac, my mood lightened as if a cloak had been lifted from my shoulders. I looked over at my wife, her face aglow from the shining lights, and smiled for the first time in days. We sat in the comfortable quiet of the car and simply enjoyed the time together until the glorious lights of heaven faded away. Then I drove home, a different man than when I left. Wow. And um, that really happened. Um, I had a lot of trouble with seasonal affective disorder. That's the reason we didn't stay in Alaska. We didn't know at that time it was called SAD, or seasonal affective disorder. 24 hours of darkness for weeks and weeks at a time finally took uh, its hold on my disposition. Well, that's the last of everything I have to uh, say to you today. Um, I do hope that you'll come by our book if you would love to read the book. We have copies of the book here. I'd love to sign them. We'd love to do that. But also, i uh, love to see if there's any questions. Pat, do you want to come up and just join me? We do hope that you'll continue um, our adventure by reading the book. Oh, one last little thing. Just that we let the people see that. I talked to you about the three principles that I learned. And if you remember these principles uh, tomorrow, uh, the next day, when the next storm hits, and you can't get in out of home because you're living under extreme circumstances. This is what I blog about in psychology today. That I learned to improvise. Improvise was the key to doing everything that I had to do. I also had to learn to be flexible. Very difficult to do when you're in charge of something. If you do something wrong, someone's going to die. Mm -hmm. But I learned to be flexible, and I learned I had to persevere no matter what. Don't let it get me down. Keep working on it. And those three principles. That's the principles of the calling art. Wow. Anybody have any questions about the artist, the publishing industry, anything? Yes, sir. You mentioned that she had to do surgery with no or with little anesthesia. Correct. What types of procedures were you able to do and, and what type what of anesthesia did, I have? did you fashion? I, I uh, finally, you know, you don't pick up the phone and call Anchorage. We didn't have telephones. So you, you write a letter. If you're lucky, two weeks later, it'll make its way to Anchorage. I had lidocaine, which is a, a, you know local anesthetic. It's what they give you if you give a cut. I, I asked them to give me ketamine. Ketamine is, um, are you a physician? Um, ketamine, other people that are not. Ketamine is something we use a lot with children. We don't like it with adults um, because it causes a lot of trouble with nightmares and bad reactions. But it's better than nothing, and you can give it IM. You can give it a shot. So I said, give me some ketamine. I had them give me some Thorazine because I had learned that I could titrate Thorazine really well and not kill anybody with it, except Piccolo Pete. I almost killed him with Thorazine up on the hill. Oh, I almost gave a secret. <laughs> uh, and so I had lidocaine, ketamine, um, Thorazine, uh, and that's virtually, oh, and then I said, they had just come out with these manufactured pre-made spinal anesthetic kits, and I said, send me some of these. I can give a spinal. 
I won't have a nurse to, to monitor O2 SAS. We couldn't monitor oxygen SAS. We didn't know how to do that. But I could teach someone to check their blood pressure. So they sent me some spinal kits. I got to the point, I used to joke about it when I had my, my real practice of medicine later. I gave so many spinals, I could do a breast spy, I'll see under spinal anesthetic. I could get that level so good just by manipulating the patient. So I did. I was improvising. I mean, what else could I do? I did appendectomies. I did a ton, it's embarrassing to say it, a ton of tubal ligations. Mm -hmm. uh, because women would come in with their 12th, 14th, 15th baby, uh, they could hardly live. And I'd say, you know, right after that, I got 15 minutes, I could make you a little tired. Um, we didn't have Versed, we did not have fentanyl, we had none of that stuff. But I could do a, a post, uh, postpartum tubal ligation. So C-sections, um, trauma, lots and lots of trauma appendectomies, no elective surgery, well, maybe a few lumps and bumps, lots and lots of uh, trauma, lacerations, head injuries. If we could, one of the scenes in my book was when we had to do an appendectomy. One of the very first ones, a young man came in from one of the villages, but he, I, I couldn't go out to see him. I had him chartered in. I would charter planes. They would go, they would pick on the persons. He came in, right lower carotid pain, vomiting, elevated white count. I knew he had an append I need, had appendicitis. He had to do an appy. He was about 27 years old. Um, my nurse fought with me. She said, we need to, because they had never had a doctor to work with. They had no, so they just sent everything to Anchorage and hoped for the best. We need to send him to Anchorage. We can't send him. He's, he's got a rupture. He's getting a peritonitis. There's no plane coming in for a week. We have no choice. So we had to be flexible. We had to improvise. And we did him under ketamine. When he woke up, we gave him more ketamine. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Did either uh, did Pat or any of your children suffer from seasonal affective disorder? Can you have that? My wife's a little hearing impaired. Did you hear the question? Yes, I heard the question. Um, possibly, I was pretty busy with the newborn and the little girl. We had a dog and two cats and a bird and a fish. But I, I think possibly one time you came home I was sitting in our cold forward chair, the chair that I used to nurse Adam in, and I was crying. And I was crying because the holidays were coming, we weren't going to have you know, Christmas tree and all of this. So I guess in retrospect I would have to say that was probably seasonal affective disorder. Again, we didn't have a name for it at that time. I know I knew that she was very um, sad over that the fact we would not have a Christmas tree because there were no trees in Nome. And Nome has no trees, and uh, there's no um, uh, Lowe's to go buy an artificial tree, of course. Uh, and there's no way to get a tree at all. Um, and I knew I just couldn't let that happen, have her cry because no Christmas tree. And it, but it was our son's first Christmas, so I knew uh, one of my favorite villages to visit was the village of Elam. And it was south a little bit, and they had trees. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to be under 15 feet of snow. I realize that. But um, an occasion came uh, to, to charter a plane to go out to Elam. I don't even remember what the situation was, but there was an emergency. If I chartered a plane, I could take myself, I could take the family, it didn't matter. So I had an idea, and I asked Pat to uh, bring her knitting and uh, bring a sheet. We talk about this in the book. And my point was, after we took care of the emergency, uh, we had the husband of the village health aide put us on his sled and his snow machine. We went up in the mountains. We found a cover with snow, but we found the top of a tree that was about this high. We cut that down. Um, we took it down to the landing field. We wrapped it in a sheet that I had her. We took her knitting yarn, cinched it around so we could get her through the door of the plane. And we flew our first Christmas tree home on a Cessna. <laughs> so, and we made, um, you made, I think we floated those little birds yeah. uh, to make, we went to the, there was a, um, a shop in town that had big paper and we asked her to give us some paper. And we had glitter or something and, and she and her daughter made things. And I took a lamp, we didn't have light, so I took a lamp and made a comb, put it on the floor when we had electricity and showed it up so we would have lights on it. <laughs> so we had, we had our son's Christmas, first Christmas, as we talk about, was not on the 25th. We had a little Christmas. Alaska, Chris, uh, Arctic Christmases, not so much Alaska. Come back from those days, most people in the Arctic didn't have family. Everybody lived in the lower 48. And 
so everybody talks about an Arctic Christmas being different, that your friends really become your social group and your family kind of a thing. So we wanted Adam's first Christmas to be um, with his surrogate family there. But unfortunately, we had a Christmas, a little party plan. We were going to have popcorn because that's all we had. We didn't have any money for food. Um, but that morning, the entire family uh, got nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> so Christmas came on the 26th day. We still had it, but it was just a year late. Yes? How long were you in Alaska to fulfill your requirements? We were in Alaska for two years. We were in, um, when I, I finally applied, uh, there were some horrible, horrible social issues for me. Um, and it wasn't with the Eskimo people. The Eskimo people in Nome were fabulous people. The non-Eskimo people, the um, Caucasian people, uh, the majority were, were fine, but there was an element. There's probably an element here in Idlewild. There's always an element. And this element of Caucasian people resented the fact, terribly resented the fact, that they were not able in their little town to attract a doctor to stay. They could never get it. A doctor would come stay for a week and leave. You work 24-7, you have no hospital, you have nothing. So private doctors would come and go. This hospital administrator that made our life miserable had this wonderful house, but he wouldn't let us get into it because he thought, someday I'm going to get the doctor. One day he got a doctor. He stayed for one week and he left, leaving me again by myself. And they directed all this hostility towards me because I was the government doctor. The one thing that turned the corner absolutely, not only with the, we followed a, a very tough thing. There was no doctor in Nome, Kotzebue, which was, Nome was part of the, it was called the Kotzebue Service Unit. There were like nine doctors in Kotzebue, beautiful hospital, a lot of nurses and doctors and everything. No doctors in Nome, we had a bigger population, uh, but there was no facility. So the Public Health Service did not send a doctor there. So the Eskimo people in town um, petitioned the federal government to, they demanded to have a doctor. So finally, the service director at Kotzebue said, I'll choose one doctor and send down to Nome. He had nine, he sent one to Nome. It was a single guy. I called him Jim in the book. That wasn't his name, but that's what I called him. Um, he did not want to go to Nome. No one wanted to go to Nome because life was horrible there. <laughs> Jim came. He made the big mistake of getting an Eskimo girlfriend. Uh, that was a bad thing back then. Uh, it was even worse that the girl was 15 years old. The girl became pregnant, and he was going to perform an abortion in the clinic. I mean, and that was like a capital offense. And we didn't know any of this. We learned that that's why they sent me. I was safe. It was really the reason they sent me. I'm sure of it. I had a wife, I had a child, and my wife was pregnant. And I had a general medical internship send him. He's hopefully not going to get a girlfriend and get her pregnant. The National Guard had to send a helicopter from Anchorage to Nome one night. The doctor that preceded me had to hide out in the morgue that they were going to string him up in the middle of town and castrate him um, wow. because of what he did. It was that severe. And then. I show up. So, I mean, it was kind of already hitting the fan before we ever came. You add that thing with the Eskimo people, and you add the Caucasian element, and it was really rough on us until a very important decision was made, and it was made by Pat. She said, we need to have our baby here. You need to prove to people. The people up there, yeah, yeah, the people aren't sophisticated enough to know a doctor shouldn't take care of his own family. It's, very, it's hard to detach from your friends, let alone your wife and your child. And yet, um, they don't realize that. And it was Pat's decision. She could have gone to Anchorage. Uh, she could have had the baby at the big hospital, had all of the wells and, you know, bells and whistles, and come home. She made the decision to have the baby there, have me deliver the baby. That was the single biggest thing that turned the corner of our life at home. That's all it is. So yeah, Pat. And how long was your mother-in-law there? Three months. No, I think she was there about a month. Long enough. We had um, there were seven churches, and seven bars. We were members of the Lutheran Church. We had Adam baptized as an infant and shortly after that she left so he was you know Gosh, I, I think that was a pivotal moment also 
we knew her on her own, but yet we had grandma there. I mean, she was helping. She wasn't, she was helping me because she was helping Pat and helping with the baby. I woke up, I had to get to the, the hospital and start my radio traffic, or there was radio calls. Seven in the morning, uh, I would get home six, seven, eight o'clock at night, go back. We, you know, we, we didn't have an emergency room. I mean, there were back doors that people could come, and we had no telephone and no beepers, of course, nothing at all like that. So if I was needed at night, oh, at the nurse's station at the hospital, I say hospital in quotes, um, there was one of these radios. And if a trauma happened, which was usually a snow machine accident or a stabbing or even a shooting or something in one of the Eskimo villages, they would call in at night, two in the morning. The nurse then had a way to contact um, uh, Frank, who owned the cab, and she would dispatch Frank in the cab to come to our house pound on our door and say you're needed at the clinic. And so we were on all the time. But So I really was a pretty bad dad and husband because I had no opportunity. But because Grandma was there to help us, help Pat with Chantel, our daughter, and with Adam, uh, vicariously that helped me, of course. When she left, I think it might have hit me harder than you even. I had this sudden feeling that, wow, we're really on our own. And remember, we're at 20 miles. 26. It's not like we're 40 and we've got our life together. Um, it was frightening. It was really frightening. After we left Anchorage, after we left Nome, I eventually, mostly because of the social situation, I was accused of mal malpractice, for example, um, by um, three, I was, I was accused of giving substandard care to the Caucasians in town, which of course I didn't care who I saw, I just did the work. I was paid absolutely nothing to see the white people in town. I don't even know if the hospital got paid. We never knew any of that. I do know, this is interesting, when our son was born in the hospital, I'm public health service, I'm military, we get a bill, number one, for the hospital work and everything. We get a bill for physician services. <laughs> I'm the one that did all the work. <laughs> this, was the ho this was McCoy. This was the hospital. This is what we had to deal with every single day. And finally, between that and the darkness, the thought of facing another winter, I'm not so sure I could have done it, to tell you the truth. It was that bad. I, I don't have a suicidal bone in my body, but if I did, I think it would have metastasized at that point. So we went to Anchorage. When we went to Anchorage, I was in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology for about four months until we left. Um, but it was a, oh, I felt like I was on vacation. I mean, <laughs> literally on vacation. I'd get up in the morning, there's no radio traffic. I, we'd have clinic from 9 until 9.30, and then maybe hang out for a while, hoping there was a surgery, so there was something to do, you know. I'd go home by 4. We had a midwife that did all the deliveries, so I had no obstetrics. But because I was a bush doctor, and we were known as the bush doctors, because I was a bush doctor who all of a sudden was in Anchorage, that didn't happen very often. And when another bush doctor would want to go on leave or go on temporary duty or do something else, they needed coverage, they would send me. So I had none of the social issues to worry about. I would have a place to stay. I would have a clinic. I mean, it was fabulous. So I got to go all over Alaska doing TDY, temporary duty. And it was wonderful. And it truly did. Then all I had to do was practice medicine. And real medicine then. And it rekindled my whole love of medicine and why I became a doctor in the first place. Because I wasn't sure after being at home. It was so tough, the life that we had there. So what did Noam do after you left? A, a doctor from Kotzebue came down. I threatened to go AWOL, not realizing I didn't get into a federal prison. I just threatened anything. I just couldn't take it anymore. And, and one fella in Nome, his name was Dave Hobbs. I named him the book a different name because I likewise couldn't reach him. He came down and he was there for a few weeks. He used to come down. It, part of the problem was I had to go out to villages almost once a week. Well, when I left Nome to go to a village because I had to, Nome was uncovered. So what are we going to do? Lady comes in and labor, no doc. I mean, it, it was a real problem. So Dave would come down and, and he would cover every now and then. And finally he and his family moved down. And what I understand is Dave stayed after I left. Um, he was from a, a well-to-do family. Um, money was not an issue. We were beyond broke. I mean, we had no money at all. Um, and he, he was kind of that hippie, kind of one of those philanthropy kind of people really wanted to help. I think Kotzebue sent someone else. Now, I understand now, I haven't been back to Nome. I've been back to Anchorage, but not to Nome. 
And I understand uh, an organization called uh, Norton Sound Health Corporation has come in, has built a hospital, has done other things, and I don't know, it's probably totally different now. I had someone tell me earlier, maybe not so much. I don't think it's any different out in the villages. Um, the villages are, are not going to change much, I think. The villages now do have internet, at least Nome has internet. Um, we had, we would get some TV when we finally moved it to our trailer, the PHS, and we have pictures of this in the book, I don't have any pictures here. Public Health Service sent us a trailer uh, where there's two put pieces, two halves together, and they put some, and it was built specifically for the Arctic, and it was a trailer, no different than a trailer, but yet it was the nicest house in town, mm -hmm. and we were on the one street that had running water and sewer, mm -hmm. and we had power much of the time, not all of the time, so life got a lot better then. Now I imagine there's a house, at least for the Public Health Service down there. But when we went to Anchorage, we rented a duplex, I mean, we had stuff. It was real life there. <laughs> Um, and, it was, and then we, we made a decision, we loved Alaska, we loved the Eskimo people, we loved the Arctic. Uh, we loved St. Lawrence Island and the village of Savunga. We actually gave a little thought of living in Savunga, which is beyond the end of the world, um, because the people there are so wonderful and so kind and so loving. Um, the darkness would have prevented that. Their water had to be hauled from a spring in buckets to your house. They didn't have any delivery service. And no more water is delivered by a big truck put into big, big tanks at the end bottom of the house. Um, but in uh, Anchorage, of course, we, we just had everything. We thought perhaps we would settle in the town of Homer, which is an actually a beautiful, beautiful little town. Um, I made the decision uh, under no circumstances would I ever be the only doctor in a town again. You have no life if you're the only doctor. I would always have at least one partner. And there was a doctor, I don't even know how we found out about it, in Homer that was looking for a partner. There was a nine bed hospital there, a real hospital. So I think we took every penny that we had and made a trip down to Homer to check it out. I was My commission was coming to the end of public health service, ready to sign on the dotted line. And uh, just as we were fixing to, get, to go down to Homer, there was a dock strike in Seattle. And just like in Nome, uh, the grocery stores, everything, Pat would find out, all the store shelves were blank mm -hmm. because Alaska depends upon Seattle. And if Seattle is not working, you know, Alaska's not working. So she got a little, she didn't want to go back to the life of no milk, no toilet paper, no cheese, no anything. You know. And I did not want to go to where I was the only doctor. Got down there, had an appointment to see this doc, and he never showed up. He wasn't there. And I knew the moment that we would come, he would never show up. There also was, uh, there was no high school there at that time. Our kids could have gone to school to the eighth grade, and then we'd have to have them go ahead to, you know, to a little more high school, and we didn't want that. We didn't parent our kids. So did you guys go from Anchorage to Little Harvey? Yes, we went from Anchorage. Uh, Pat uh, was raised in Oregon, and we went uh, from Anchorage right down to Oregon, um, set up our, our um, practice in a small town in Oregon, and our entire practice was in Oregon. So we retired so I could write full-time. Yes, sir. Why is uh, Anchorage so relying on Seattle? Washington? Uh, Seattle, Washington, right, because of shipping. Because shipping and planes, uh, and if there's a strike, um, it certainly affects shipping, that's for sure. I'm not sure about whether it affects airplanes or not. I was there, I still do a little work with the VA system. I'm doing some disability exams, and every now and then I go to Anchorage and do those exams. And um, one day, I went to the store, I wanted to get some half and half to put in my morning coffee and stuff. And I went, and all the milk was all gone. This was just like last year. And I went to get some cookies or something like that. And I looked around, and there was nothing, and there was a lady shopping, and I said, where's all the stuff? And she said, "There's um, the ship didn't come in, or the barge didn't come in, or something like that. And I said, oh, is that still happening here? She gives me this ah, every month. <laughs> so I think it's, it's not so much the same. You know, bringing cargo in by aircraft is very expensive and everything goes by ship. When we sent our, our uh, supplies up from Stockton, California, which is where we interned, our supplies, where your supply food that we had to buy, uh, did not get up until, well, it was freeze up. So that was probably late October. So it was June, July, August, September, and October, all those five months by ship. And the only way really to get things in is by air, but that's mm -hmm. prohibited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, thank you again for coming. If you would like to um, pick up a copy of the book, <laughs> well, let's see.